Thank you so much for joining me today on Just Praise Him Radio. I'm your host, Linda Lomax, and my job is to inspire you to a closer walk with Christ. Now here's the show. Hello, believers. Welcome to the Just Praise Him radio show. I'm your host, Glenda Lomax, and I don't know the title of my message today. <laughs> I just realized I didn't give it a name. This is not the message that I had for you. That's why I don't have a name, I guess. I had planned to teach on taking dominion, and I had that one all written. But just when I was about to record, the Lord told me that somebody who is listening is about to take their life, and he showed me that you needed encouragement that you're up against the wall and you don't know what to do. So that's why we're changing the show. So I think that you're a woman, but you may be a man, or there may be more than one. Either way, the Lord wants you to know that he sees what is happening. He sees where you are and he cares. He can only help you if you will give this situation to him in faith, okay? Remember the story of Hagar in the Bible? One of God's names is Elroy, the God who sees me. Elroy is, uh, was first used by Hagar in Genesis 16, 13, when she declared, you are the God who sees me. She was pregnant by Abraham. S- uh, Sarah, Abraham's wife, had given him Hagar, her maid, to you know, bear children as a, another wife to him, which was the custom in that day. Even though God had said, you know, I'm going to give you a child, Sarah was like, yeah, right, I'm 90 years old. And so after years and years of trying to conceive, she gave up and she gave Hagar to Abraham, and Hagar became pregnant. And Hagar began to kind of despise Sarah because of it. So anyway, Sarah got, Hagar got on Sarah's last nerve, and and, uh, she didn't want her around anymore. And I believe that by then Sarah had gotten pregnant with Isaac, and she said, cast out this bondwoman and her child. And so Abraham, he didn't want to, but he did it. And Hagar and her child were near death. They had gone out into the desert where Abraham sent them with, you know, like a loaf of bread and some water, and they, they couldn't go any further. And the child was on the brink of death. And God spoke to her. So he saw Hagar's plight, and he sees your plight too, Okay. Also, there is a particular woman of God who is listening, and you ask the Lord for a message. And he says to tell you that if you will just hang on a little bit longer, he has something wonderful in the works for you. But somebody who is involved in answering your prayer is fighting his plan. So he says to you to pray and declare the answer while you wait in great joy, for the answer is coming. Now, for anyone who's not familiar with the Just Praise Him radio show, The Lord gives us a lot of prophetic messages in general. And the rule of thumb is, if you hear a a message, no matter if somebody else is, a lot of times we'll get the names. And even if it says somebody else's name, if when you hear that message, it sounds like it's God speaking to you, then that word is also for you. A word of God can be for many people, okay? Okay, there's a man who is out of work who's listening to this. You've been feeling kind of worthless, not being able to find a job. The Lord says to you, man of God, that this is by his design. And he wants you to leave those feelings behind because you do have a job. You now work for him. He says he wants you to go out into the streets and to preach to the homeless. He wants you to encourage those who have been unemployed for years. He says hand out tracts, but put them in bags along with practical necessities that they can use. And include Christian books in those bags. And he showed me that everything in those bags does not have to be brand new. Okay. He says to do it now. He says he is going to amaze you with where this ministry leads you. He says each night that you go out, when you go back home, he wants you to journal what you experienced and what you learned. Do not sleep until you have done this or the enemy will steal it from your mind. He says this is very important. You're going to use this information for something, but I cannot see what it's going to be used for. Go forth, man of God. Okay, now, I want to encourage those of you who are having a hard time right now. 
who are discouraged, who are in despair, and especially any of you who are thinking about taking your life. I want you to realize, I, you know, despair is something I have been all too well acquainted with, uh, especially before I found Jesus, but it even occasionally will attack me now. I don't know if I told you all this, but around Christmas, I got into despair. It was a really, really hard Christmas. I usually spend Christmas alone. That is not uncommon for me at all. I seldom ever have anybody to spend Christmas with. And I mean, sometimes my friends around here will invite me to come eat with them and stuff, but that's not who I want to eat Christmas with. I don't want to eat Christmas dinner with a friend. I want to be with somebody I love in my family. So I was alone this Christmas, and it just, this year, just, you know, this last year, it just got to me. Probably because, you know, we spent most of the year dealing with the pandemic. So that was stress upon, upon top of the stress that we were all already under. And it was bad. It was really bad. But the Lord pulled me out of it. Praise his name. And I'm much better now. I'm not in despair now. That just lasted for a couple of days. And since I had dealt with it so much in the past decades ago, I always have that little mental list that I had made up years and years ago that if depression started trying to get on me, I had a list of things that I would do that I knew 99% of the time they would pull me out of it. So I still knew what that list was. And let me encourage you that if you are in despair and you are not able to pull yourself out of it, go talk to somebody. Okay, go get some help. There is no shame in getting help. The Lord gave us doctors because they can help us. He gave us medicines because they can help us. Do what you need to do to stay on this earth until he says it's time for you to leave. Please hear me on this. This is very important. This is very important. There are, you know, there are conditions now and conditions coming that are going to make us all want to give up, okay? Even the strongest among us have days when we just feel a little bit beat down. And we sometimes have days where, you know, because, you know, the people around you can make your life better or they can make it worse. And we have days when we feel beat down, and then somebody beats us down on top of that with their words. So, you know, you're not alone. Just let me tell you, you are not alone. And if you're really having a hard time, I encourage you to go to the website, which is justpraisehim.today, and go to the comment section of the most recent word and reach out there and just say, hey, can somebody please pray for me? I am having a really bad day, or I'm having a bad life, or whatever's going on. You don't have to tell your whole story, but you can tell some of it, and say, please pray for me. I heard on the Just Praise Him show that I could come here and leave a comment, and somebody would pray for me. We have the most wonderful fellowship there, and Dina, my assistant, has named it the Just Praise Him Fellowship Community, and that's exactly what it is. That is exactly what it is. I need to make a website where we can get together at certain times or something and encourage each other because iron sharpens iron, y'all. It does, and this is a very hard time to be alive in. But if you are alive, it's because God still has something for you to do. Can I just tell you that? Because when you're done with all your stuff, he'll take you home. That's the way that works. Okay, now, today's gifts are sometimes in really ugly wrapping paper. Like when I went through those wilderness journeys, those lessons that God was teaching me are, are tools that I use every day, y'all, every day. You always come out of the wilderness with a gift in your hands. And I came out of those wildernesses with so many gifts and so many tools, gifts, a gift of strong faith that no matter what is going on, I know that my God will take care of me. I know that I can believe him and I can just say, Lord, I need help with this. And I can lay it at his feet and he'll help me with whatever it is. He'll give me revelation on the situation. He'll do something. And he will do that for you, too, if you will reach out to him. And it not, it, no matter what you have done, no matter what kind of sin you've had in your life, even if you're still struggling with sins, God will still help you. He will still bless you. He, he doesn't say, oh, get yourself all cleaned up and then approach me. No, God will take you just like you are. Can I just tell you that? When he called me, y'all, I was a big mess. I was a mess. I was living out in the world a very hedonistic lifestyle. It was like if I if it was fun, I was just out there just having fun, you know, as best I could. You can't you can't enjoy life as much as you think you're going to enjoy it without Jesus, but you don't know that until you have Jesus. So but I was just living for the moment and then God called me. He spoke to me through somebody who had a prophetic gifting, a young girl. In fact, she was 15 or 16 years old. 
And my life changed from that day forward because I realized he is El Roy. He is the God who sees me. I had no idea that, you know, he even knew I was there, much less had a plan for my life. Nobody ever told me that. I didn't know he had a, God has a plan for your life. He has a plan. And if you say yes to him, he will help you to walk in that plan. And it will be greater and better than anything you ever dreamed. And he gives you his peace to boot, the peace that passes all understanding. When it makes no sense whatsoever for you to have peace, you will have peace when you walk with him. And when I say walk with him, that means you talk to him every day, you pray every day, you try to read the Bible a little bit every day or listen to sermons, you know, so you're getting an understanding of his word as you go along and you're trying to live your life right. And that means that you try, when he shows you a sin you need to give up, you try to give it up. You do your best for him, okay? That we're not perfect, none of us are perfect. I don't care if you walked with God for 50 years, you may think you're perfect, but you're not perfect either. None of us are. Only Jesus walked a perfect walk. But we can do our best. We can do our very best, and we can constantly ask the Lord to show us any place we're missing it, um, show us any place that we can do better, show us any place that, you know, we're not pleasing him. And you can have a happy life, and you can live in peace. All you have to do is say, Jesus, I'll try it your way. Show me what you got. I didn't pray the whole long salvation prayer when I got saved. I just said, okay, Lord, I say yes. You know, let's do this. Show me what you got. I said, I want to try your plan. And then I started laying my plan down. You know, someone said once that despair is anger with no place to go. And sometimes we are angry, aren't we? Sometimes we are just, I don't know, things don't work out right. Anger at the injustices of life. Anger that somebody you love don't love you back. Anger that somebody else got the promotion you thought was yours or the house you thought was yours or anything else. Anger that you lost your job, your spouse, your health, your home. Anger that you can't overcome that addiction. Anger that no matter how hard you try, you just cannot seem to come out on top. We all deal with these things from time to time. And if we dwell on them, which Satan wants you to do, by the way, if we dwell on the injustices and the losses of life, instead of dwelling on the hope that God gives us, then we will start to slowly lose our hope. And you know, a pandemic's a real good time to do something like that. Well, I lost my job, now I'm not gonna get promoted, now my bills are behind, now blah, 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 this and that. And, and Satan is just like blah, blah, blah. And he just keeps feeding you more because he wants you to stay on the negative channel. He don't want you to change channel to hope, okay? A lack of hope can kill you and he knows that. I want to read y'all something. This is from Today in the Word from May 1990. This is about a laboratory experiment. A number of years ago, researchers performed an experiment to see the effect hope has on those undergoing hardship. Two sets of laboratory rats were placed in separate tubs of water. The researchers left one set in the water and found that within an hour they had all drowned. The other rats were periodically lifted out of the water and then returned. When that happened, the second set of rats swam for over 24 hours. Why? Not because they were given a rest, but because they had hope. They somehow hoped that if they could just stay afloat a little longer, somebody would reach down and rescue them. Hope's effect on our lives is so great, y'all, that without it, we, we just we can't go on. You have to have some kind of hope. That something's going to get better. You know, as Christians, we know that no matter what happens to us in this life, we have heaven to look forward to, right? But sometimes life can get awfully hard. I struggled with that a lot back when I was married uh, to my children's father. And the abuse was going on all the time. Because it, we lived in terrible poverty on top of the abuse, and that was a pretty hopeless situation. It was hard to find hope then. Very hard. I remember at one point... I think I was 23 when this was happening. I was working for a large law firm in McKinney, Texas. And I was not doing very well in my job because I'd never worked in the legal field before at that time. And I remember that because at home things were terrible and at work they weren't really much better. And I remember that the one thing I looked forward to every day was I had this calendar that each day there was a, a tiny colorful picture on it, a scene of something. 
And that was actually the bright spot in my day then. I didn't know Jesus yet. I knew that nothing was going to be good when I went home. So weekends were really bad because then I had to be home for two whole days. But that little tiny bright picture on that calendar was what I hung on to for a long time. I worked there for a year. And for months, that was all I had that gave me hope. I didn't even know what to hope for anymore at that point because it was just really, everything was bad. Anyhow, find something. Find that little bright spot, something. And I have a suggestion for you. When you don't have hope, think of all the other people who also don't have hope and go help somebody else. Clean out your stuff. You know, stuff that you're done with or you don't use or can't wear or whatever, maybe really something uh, that's a big blessing to someone else who has far less. So clean out your stuff and go give to someone else or help somebody else or lift somebody else up that's having a hard time. No matter what we have lost, God always has something better for us if we will just believe him for that, okay? And we need to learn to cast our cares on the Lord. And this really does work, y'all, but there's a, cl- there's a clue to it. I, for many years, couldn't figure out how to do that. You know, and I was kind of born a worrier. My mom was a worrier. She was a full-time worrier. She had like a PhD in worrying. And I'm, I'm pretty good at it, my own self. And so I have to stop myself when I kick into that and say, no, it, that's not going to help anything and give it to God and walk away. Okay. So there's a key to casting your care. There's something that you have to understand for it to work. To prove that you have faith in him, you have to let it go. So I'm going to read you a poem that I fell in love with long ago. I found a copy of it on God's Little Acre, godslittleacre.net. Nice little website. It's called Broken Toys. As children bring their broken toys with tears for me to bend, I brought my broken dreams to God because he was my friend. But then instead of leaving him in peace to work alone, I hung around and tried to help with ways that were my own. At last, I snatched them back and cried, How can you be so slow? My child, he said, What could I do? You never did let go. That's by Ben Hilder, and I love that poem. You can find that on godslittleacre.net if you want to look at it or print it out. People around us can make what we're going through at any given time better or they can make it worse. We always want to be the people that make other people's hard times better, not worse. But I'm going to read you something. I wrote about this in a column years and years ago. On a gray morning just before the dawn of spring in 2003, some family members and I traveled along the interstate to visit my older sister who was near death in Amarillo. We drove quickly, talking quietly about all the things you talk about when you realize you're about to lose someone you love. We stopped at a travel stop along the way to get fresh coffee. That travel stop was in Shamrock, Texas, I believe. As I tried to get the level in my cup just right, I heard a sharp voice behind me. This was like a coffee machine where you press it with your cup and then the coffee comes out. I think it was like a cappuccino machine or something. I turned around and an older man behind the counter was scolding me, red in the face and shaking his finger, accusing me of toying with the coffee machine. I was so shocked at his behavior, I was rendered nearly speechless. I quickly paid for my coffee and exited the store after apologizing for whatever offense he had taken. As I walked back to my car, I wondered if the man had known where our thoughts were that day, if he would have made any difference in his conduct, if he would have shown kindness instead of rudeness. I was wearing dark sunglasses that day. We had been, we had all been crying so much and my eyes were all swelled up. Someone once said that friends are the flowers in the garden of life. The less friendly people are surely the thistles and thorns. We don't want to be the thistles and thorns in anyone else else's life. And I'll tell you something too, when you think about taking your own life, because I lost a brother to suicide in 1987. He was my younger brother. He was the youngest of all of us five siblings. And he was precious to me. We were like twins. And we were like two halves of the same whole. And I was devastated. I did not stop grieving heavily until, was it 2018, after I moved here to Arkansas when I published The Grief Companion. God lifted that grief from me. That was the gift he gave me when I published that book. I've never been so relieved. 31 years is a long time to grieve, y'all. You don't want to cause someone else that grief. Please don't do that to them. I cannot even tell you 
how much worse grief is when someone took their own life than if they die some other way. Because you know that they had to be in tremendous pain and anguish to do that. And you spend the rest of your life going, oh, well, if I'd only said this, or if I had made more time in my life, or if I had done this or done that, maybe they wouldn't have died. So you spend the rest of your life torturing yourself as if the grief isn't bad enough. Please don't do that to someone you care about, even if you just care about them a little bit. Even if they drive you up the wall or make your life a nightmare at times, please don't do that to them. And we don't know for sure how the Lord looks on suicide. You know, Galatians 6, 9 says, Let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we will reap if we faint not. We need to be careful not to give up, y'all. For ourselves, for the Lord, and for all the, the lost souls that still need whatever gift that we carry that we have to give them. So I want to tell y'all a story. This is not a long story. For about... I don't know how many weeks, a month or more, the Lord had put on my heart this one church in the town where I live, an Assembly of God church. And I couldn't figure out what he wanted me to do because he didn't just come out and tell me. He just was leading me towards that church. I'm like, okay, they must have a need or something like that. And so I'd put in a call to the church, and a couple of days later, the pastor called me back. And I thought, okay, he's really nice and seems like a good pastor and everything. And so I decided to go up to the church and take an offering, you know, in case that would be a blessing to them. I went to the church, and I just went for worship and preaching. And in that one hour and a half, God changed my life. I'm not kidding you. And if you had told me a month ago that I would become a churchgoer, I would have probably laughed at you. In this town, because there's not a lot of churches, what there is, there's just, I think that's the only one that's actually charismatic, which is how I believe. I have never in my life, on a first visit to a church, felt so comfortable. And I walked in late because the devil fought me all the way to the church. I don't think I've ever showed up late at church before. I don't remember if I have. And I have never in my life felt so welcome any place. It's a very small congregation, probably 25 people. And I felt so welcome there and so loved the pastor's wife after worship was over she got up from where she was sitting all the way in the front and walked back just to shake my hand and say hi to me and I just you know it was such a contrast to years ago in the early 90s when God was drawing me before this was years before I was saved God was drawing me and I went and visited three different churches in Elk City and Nobody even acted like they cared I was there. Maybe they didn't want me to come to their church. I don't know, but because that was back in, you know, my days when I lived in sin. But, I, you know, I would have changed my life if someone had just reached out to me. You know, do you need to be sick? Can I pray with you? You know, something. You know, I was, they just ignored me like I wasn't even there. And every time I was like, okay, I'm done here. And I just never would go back. And after the third one, I said, okay, you know, I'm looking for Jesus. He's supposed to be in the church. I can't find him. I don't know where else to look. And so I just went back out into the world for three more years. If you are a churchgoer and somebody walks into your church, please don't ever do that to them. Please make them feel welcome and feel loved. Please. Because you don't know if that person's about to go home and load the gun, okay? You don't know. You don't know what they're going through or how God drew them. If he drew them to your church, there's a reason why he drew them. They walked through that door to your church. And everyone in that church has a responsibility to reach out and make that person welcome. But I'm telling you, this church scored 100%. I'm so impressed. So I'm a church goer again now and happy about it, really happy about it. We are already planning community outreach. And I have never, ever, ever in my entire life wanted to go out and knock on doors and tell people about Jesus. I ran from churches that did that. Guess what? I'm going to be doing it. Not only am I going to be doing it, but I've already got all kinds of ideas about doing it that I've been talking to the pastor's wife about. So I thought that I was going to that church to bless them, but guess what? God was setting me up to be blessed. My eyes filled with tears about five times during that hour and a half that I was sitting there because I was so amazed at the love in that place. And I felt the presence of God in that church. 
Every single worship song they sang glorified Jesus. Every single one. And, you know, I had the other kind of experience with the other church that I helped start here where nothing was really about Jesus. And Jesus was never glorified. That's why God shut that church down. Because I asked him, I said, Lord, I'm, you're sovereign. You can do anything you want, but I'm just kind of curious. And it was because he was never lifted up there. If we're not going to church to lift up Jesus, yeah, that's kind of the point, right? So there are people that can make your life better and your situation better and people that can make it worse. I am in the process of having a server built to put the website on. And I am hoping to have some kind of something on the website where we can get together and just chat with each other, make posts, you know, where you can post if you've got a need that needs to be prayed about, you know, things like that. I'm not sure what all to put on there, but I just want y'all to know this is in the works. This website's been in the works forever, but you're going to love it when you see it. It is so pretty. Um, speaking of the devil and despair and people acting like the devil around you, there were two little boys walking home from Sunday school where the lesson had been on the devil, and one asked the other, what do you think about this devil business? Well, replied the other boy, you know how Santa Claus turned out. It's either your mother or your father. <laughs> I think that's so cute. Yeah, when you're already in despair, it's not a good thing to be around negative people. There are so many people in the world who just cannot seem to say it a single nice thing about anybody or anything. And they constantly complain and speak negative and they're just not being thankful to the Lord for his blessings. And you know, we can all slip into that if we don't watch what comes out of our mouth, can't we? Those are people that, and we don't want to be in this group, that fall into the group of people that can brighten up a room just by leaving it, right? We don't want to be in that group, y'all. Isaiah forty thirty one says, But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. That's the group we want to be in. You know, the pandemic stresses everybody out because none of us know what's going to happen or how long the thing's going to last or what's coming. We don't know. We don't know what's coming behind it. What we do know is that we live in a very late hour and things are looking bad. This week, this week, I got a link by uh, email or text, I don't remember which, that Pope Francis had called for a new world order after the pandemic, or because of the pandemic, I think, because of the pandemic, had called for a new world order. And I'm going, yeah, let's don't do that. So we have got to fight the despair that tries to set in on us, y'all. We just have to put one foot in front of the other. Just take the next step. Just keep moving forward. Even if it's in baby steps, look for something to cling to that just kind of brightens your day a little bit, you know, and, and try to get your hope back. I have lived ever since those wilderness journeys that I went through. My dreams were crushed in those. Never in my life had I been without dreams until I went through those. And I just went into full-on survival mode after that. Go to work, get the paycheck, go home, pay the bills. Go to work, get the paycheck, go home, pay the bills. I mean, I literally went into that mode. And that became all that mattered besides, obviously, following God because I was so traumatized by what I'd been through and how close I became, came to get being homeless. By the way, I want to talk to y'all about this severe fatigue everybody's been fighting. I think I have a revelation on this. Because I've been fighting it for a while. I don't know how long. It started months ago. And it, it got so bad, I actually went to the doctor and had blood work done last week. Because I was like, okay, is there something, you know, organically wrong that needs to be corrected or what's going on? But there's nothing organically wrong, I'm happy to say. But it just got so bad. But I've also gotten numerous emails from other people, and they're all... Incidentally, Christians who walk closely with the Lord, who are also experiencing this fatigue. So I started really seeking the Lord and saying, okay, Lord, something's up with this. What is going on with all this extreme fatigue? And the Lord answered me the other day, and he said, Satan wants my people to be asleep in this time so he can continue gaining souls. And that was uh, March 10th when that happened. We've had attacks of fatigue before. Dina was kind enough to look up some, because I thought I had taught on that before, and Dina had looked up some uh, podcasts that I'd done about it before. One was called Exhausted for No Reason, Wearing Down the Saints. I did it in June 4th, 2019. One was Have You Felt Like Giving Up Lately, September 22nd, 2016, and Intense Attacks on the Body of Christ, November 3rd, 2015. Thank you, Dina, for 
researching those. And if you're ever trying to find anything that I've put out, Dina is just a master at finding them. She knows my stuff backwards and forwards. I don't know how, but she does. And she is Rover Radar in the comments section. You can hit her up and she can tell you right where something is. You may think that you don't matter and you may think that you don't have anything really to contribute, you know, in a situation. But let me tell you, you do. I'm going to read y'all a story. In his book, When God Whispers Your Name, Max Lucado tells the story of John Eglin, who had never preached a sermon in his life before the Sunday morning when it snowed and the pastor was not able to make it to church. In fact, he was the only deacon to show up. He was not a preacher, but he was faithful. And that meant that on that particular Sunday morning, he was going to preach. God rewarded his faithfulness. And at the end of his hesitant sermon, one young man invited God into his heart. No one there could appreciate the significance of what had taken place that morning. The young man who accepted Christ that snowy Sunday morning was none other than Charles Haddon Spurgeon, the man who has often been called the Prince of Preachers. God blessed his preaching, and when he was still less than 30 years old, he became the pastor of London's Metropolitan Tabernacle. His sermons were so powerful that although the building could hold 5,000 people, the crowds who came to hear him were so thick that they would line up outside trying to hear his sermons. That amazing life of faith all started on a cold Sunday morning with the faithfulness of a deacon who had never preached a sermon before that day. Faithfulness means being committed to what God lets us have the chance to do, whether it looks like a big assignment or a small one. Giving the sermon to a handful of people on a Sunday morning when almost nobody shows up does not seem like it would be significant, but it demanded faithfulness, and God blessed John Eglin's faithfulness. Think about that. You know, I don't think anybody remembers the name of the man who helped Billy Graham pr pray through, but we sure know who Billy Graham is, don't we? But I'll bet you God remembers the name of the man who helped him pray through. And can you imagine his rewards in heaven? This is a time for winning souls. Because there is a lot of souls out there, y'all, that are going to die and go to hell sometime in the near future. Because we don't have a lot of time left before God's going to call us home. And when God takes the church out of the earth, the light's going to go out. And how will they believe then? Don't think that what he's called you to do is small. If you just witness in your local grocery store, that's not small. Anything that you do, and every time that you glorify Jesus counts. So I just want to encourage you today. Make the most of wherever you are and whatever you have to give. Go out and encourage somebody else. Clean out your house with all your extra stuff that you don't need anymore and go give it away. Go give it away. Go to a local church and hook up with some other believers. And go out and witness. There's a lost and dying world around us. We can't afford to sit back in our easy chairs. We have to do the work he's called us to do. Jesus bless you. Thanks for listening. Y'all have a great week. Thank you so much for tuning in today to Just Praise Him Radio. You can contact me by mail at my new address, JPH Inc., Glenda Lomax, P.O. Box 60 Glencoe, Arkansas, 72539, or by email at jphtoday at gmail.com. JPH is not affiliated with any nonprofit organization, church, or denomination. Does your life feel like it's falling apart around you? Are multiple things going wrong all at once? Does it seem all your comforts have been stripped away? You may have entered the wilderness. Wilderness experiences are oftentimes of great discomfort and lack. Every Christian must pass through the desert on the way to their promised land. Find out how to go from surviving to thriving by partnering with God as He leads you in the path that will strengthen your faith and prepare you to step into your destiny. The Wilderness Companion will help you find out why you have been led into the wilderness. Find out the biggest hindrances to receiving the provision you need in the wilderness. Find out what the seven temptations of the wilderness are. 
Learn how to partner with God in His purposes for you in the desert seasons. Get your copy of The Wilderness Companion today. The Wilderness Companion by Glenda Lomax on Amazon.com in print, Kindle, or audiobook. What is in store for the once great and mighty nation of America in these end times? What is the living God saying to the people of America now? What could possibly be in store for a nation that once trusted in God, but has changed its path from following the living God's ways to now removing Him from everything and walking the other way? In the book, No Longer Mind, you will find all the messages to America collected in one place in chronological order. No Longer Mind, Messages to an Unrepentant Nation is now available in print at wingsofprophecy.com in the bookstore tab. Get your copy of No Longer Mind today. If you ask anyone you know what the most difficult experience of their life has been, many will answer about a time of betrayal. All those called to walk the narrow path will at some point encounter Judas. How will you respond? Do you know how to recognize Judas when he shows up in your life? Can you keep Judas from bringing destruction to your life and ministry? How can you minimize what Judas cost you? Can you pass the test of absolute betrayal? Get your copy of The Judas Test, available in print and new audiobook. The Judas Test by Glenda Lomax, available now on Amazon.com. Sold out for 30 pieces of silver? In Exodus 21, 32, it is the price of a dead slave. In Leviticus 27, 2 through 7, it is the price of a live one. Jesus was sold for the price of a bondservant. Precious Jesus, the Son of God, the Prince of Peace, the King of Kings, why did Judas sell his friend out so cheap?